So we're looking at, as the title says here, a simple hydrostatic circuit. So we have a closed loop or a closed circuit hydrostatic drive system, a single path system, which means there's one pump and one motor. And we've got this one arranged. So the pump is at the left hand side. The motor is at the right hand side. The pump is an axial piston pump, variable displacement. There's a swash plate. There's the barrel with the pistons, the spring that's putting tension through the ball guide and the pins to the uh, retraction plate, etc. Uh, over here we've got a axial piston motor. This one is fixed displacement, so there is a, a plate here. You want to call it a ramp plate or swash plate. That's fine, uh, but it does not pivot. This is whatever angle this is on relative to the shaft. That is the angle that's going to determine the displacement of the motor. And then between the pump and the motor, we've got uh, two high pressure lines to uh, complete our closed circuit between the pump and the motor. So we've done what they've said here. We've put a pump and a motor on the screen. We've added the hoses between there. Uh, let's go to the next instruction here. It says to stroke the pump to forward. So we've got a shifter here, a control that would be hooked to our swash plate. Uh, so I'm going to uh, put it into forward. And that's, in essence, how our closed loop hydrostatic system is going to work. The pump swash plate now is pivoted over to the forward position. Uh, this barrel should be rotating, but in the animation they've just shown the shaft rotating. I'm not sure. I guess they didn't have the technology to make the barrel rotate, but uh, it still works pretty well. They're showing the oil leaving the pump, going to the motor. Again, they don't show the barrel rotating, even though it should be. They show the shaft rotating. Oil leaving the motor, going back to the pump. That in is, is, in essence, the most basic of concepts of a closed circuit or closed loop hydrostatic system. And we've got some color coding here, so high pressure side, red oil. And what determines that pressure, of course, is the load on the motor. So this is load induced pressure, whatever the restriction, whether we're traveling up a hill or down a hill, that's going to determine what this pressure is of the red oil. The blue oil, they're kind of getting ahead of themselves here by calling that charge pressure. It really right now is just the return oil from the motor back to the suction side of the pump. Uh, case flow pressure, well they have to show the case of the uh, motor here and this is where a case drain line would connect. And then a case of the pump and a case drain line would connect here uh, to carry that flow back to a reservoir. And then suction flow pressure, well we haven't seen that when we get to the charge system we'll have uh, have that. If I go to, to uh, back to neutral, simply put the swash plate into the neutral position here, and the pump quits pumping, and the motor quits turning. Uh, not only that, but now the motor has a dynamic brake because the oil in these lines is incompressible, the uh, pistons have no stroke, so they don't accept oil, they're already full of oil, so we effectively have a dynamic brake in a hydrostatic drive system where if you grab the shaft of this motor and tried to turn it, it won't turn because you can't compress the oil. The motor would then be acting like a pump and you'd be trying to pump oil back towards the pump, which would then be acting like a motor, but because it has no displacement, it wouldn't accept the oil. If I go into uh, reverse, well, now my high pressure is on the top here because we've tipped the swash plate the other way and the oil is going to the motor and then the direction of rotation on the shaft is reversed and then back to neutral. So now we're into part two. We're talking about leakage and the need for a charge pump, which isn't here yet, but we'll have to install one. So basically they're going to show us here uh, in the animation what the issue is uh, with a closed loop hydrostatic drive system and the need for uh, a charge pump. So they're showing here, I'm just going to zoom in on this. We're just reminding us of all the places that we could have, or we, we will have leakage in a axial piston type pump as the barrel rotates next to the port plate. There's going to be some intentional leakage through that uh, labyrinth path on the face of the barrel. Uh, as the pistons pump in and out of the barrel themselves, there's going to be some clearance here. So some oil from the pumping side here is going to leak through and come out uh, at the uh, into the case at the at the piston where it fits into the bore of the barrel. The uh, socket joint where the uh, piston goes into the slipper uh, as it swivels. There's some clearance there. Some oil is going to come out. And of course oil is traveling through the piston to that lubrication hole on the face of the slipper, lubricating the slipper as it slides on the swash plate. And then that oil is going to spin out into the case of the pump. 
So we've got all these places where K strains happening, which is normal, and that's why we have a K strain path off the top of the pump. All those issues are happening at the motor as well. Well, not issues, but all that internal leakage is happening in the motor by design. So we have a K strain out of the motor as well. So we're detecting leakage. Well, of course we are. Um, so we're going to have to put some K-strain lines on and put a reservoir on here to collect that leakage. So that's what they're telling us is going to happen next. So we put K-strain from the motor uh, to the reservoir, K-strain from the pump to the reservoir. This is pretty close to the system um, we looked at in our last uh, video, but uh, this oil in some systems is going to actually dump into the pump housing and flow through the pump housing on on its way back. So motor, the motor may connect right back to tank like this, or the motor case drain may flush through the case of the pump and then join the pump case drain flow. So the issue they're saying here with this case drain leakage, this is oil that started its life in the closed circuit between the pump and the motor. If that oil leaks out the case drain lines, we're going to start cavitating the pump and motor because this loop is going to run out of oil eventually. Uh, so we're going to have to have a system that puts that oil back into the loop. So we're going to put in a charge pump, sometimes called a replenishing pump, but it's going to be a fixed displacement pump. This one they're showing is a, a gyroter type. Uh, sometimes it's an external gear pump. Uh, sometimes it's a crescent type. But there's generally going to be a fixed displacement pump tied in with the variable displacement pump that's going to be drawing oil back collecting what's drained out the case drain, drawing it back from the reservoir, and pushing it back into the system. Now, because we're in forward, uh, actually, they want us to install a charge relief valve to, to limit the pressure here. This uh, gear pump would be capable of making high pressure and, and actually putting a back pressure on the motor. So they're going to want to limit that charge pressure. So we're going to put a charge relief valve in. So we put it in here. Um, typical charge pressure might be two... 200 to maybe 400 psi uh, maybe as low as 150 but uh, generally we're in that range with charge pressure maybe as as high as 500 but again we're adding because we're in forward we're adding here's our forward side of the drive loop here's the oil returning back to the pump and that's where we're adding the charge flow in so we're putting a little bit of back pressure, let's say for discussion purposes, 200 PSI charge pressure setting of this relief. Uh, we're putting 200 PSI of back pressure on the motor, but that's just going to increase the load a little bit on the uh, forward side. Uh, but because this is already returning back to the suction of the pump, that is the opportune place to put in our charge oil. And you've probably already anticipated that, well, we got a problem here. If we're going to go in reverse, uh, that is definitely not going to work because when we go in reverse, this is now going to be the high side of the system. And, of course, we got high pressure from the piston pump to the piston motor in the hydrostatic loop now trying to back feed the pump. And it's all dumping over this relief. And this charge relief, if it's only set to 200 PSI, it's effectively going to start limiting our drive pressure to 200 PSI. So this is not going to work. It's pushing back through the charge pump. We got flow meeting flow, and uh, it's just not work. This charge relief isn't sized to handle all of the flow. It's trying to dump out through uh, through to drain through the pump case and back to the reservoir. So they are showing a system failure there. So this is where the charge check valves come in. If we can put a system in like this where the charge flow can be indexed to wherever there's lower pressures than 200 if this is 200 psi is controlled by this relief valve then if the return flow from the motor here and forward is going back to the suction of the pump then we can pump that up to 200 psi uh, with with charge flow and if we go into reverse well then that check valve at the top just closed the check valve at the bottom here just opened and now we're putting our charge flow in on the forward side of the system because we're in reverse so as oil returns from the motor this way back to the now this is the suction side of the pump we're putting charge flow in through this check valve so as i go forward and reverse just watch the two check valves so reverse the bottom check valves open forward top check valves open 
reverse bottom check valves open forward top check valves open in neutral they're going to both open not that it's going to take much flow in here to charge up the loops but both sides of the loop both the forward drive side and the reverse drive side the whole loop will be pressurized up to the setting of this charge relief valve if it's 200 psi then we'll have 200 psi in both forward and reverse sides of the loop and because the pressure is equal on the motor the motor is not going to turn we're going to be holding the motor stationary with 200 psi of charge pressure and then when you go into forward uh, the this forward drive side of the loop again the pressure here will be dictated by the load on the motor the return pressure back to the suction side of the pump will be 200 psi the setting of the charge relief So again, the function of this charge or replenishing pump is to put the oil that leaked out the case drain back into the system and replenish the system with lost oil. The size of this pump is generally about maybe one-fifth to one-tenth the flow rate of the actual pump, the piston pump that's in the hydrostatic drive loop. The fixed displacement pump is generally comparatively quite small because it's only going to design, be designed to pick up whatever the maximum uh, flow we expect out the case drain uh, at any given time, plus maybe a little bit of extra reserve because the pump's going to wear over its age. But then anything it doesn't replenish into the system, we'll just go over the uh, charge relief valve and in this case dump into the pump case, do some case flushing and flush back to the reservoir and it'll just, it'll just go in a loop here on its own if the charge flow isn't needed by the system at 200 psi so we talked about load induced pressure i mean forward here the pressure in this side of the loop driving the motor and forward will be dictated by the load on the motor more load higher pressure more restriction to flow less load lower pressure well, we want to put some limits on that because the hoses are only going to be designed for a certain amount of pressure as is the components of the motor and the pump itself um, so what they're, they're warning us about high pressure here so they're going to want to install a relief valve that can limit forward drive pressure so they're going to call that a cross port relief because if the motor gets stalled or the, the drive pressure by design gets too high, uh, we're going to open this relief. But instead of dumping back to tank, we're going to dump from the forward high pressure side to the reverse side of the drive loop. So basically what this oil is doing, instead of turning the motor, if the motor gets locked, uh, either the brake is on, the tra travel motor brake, or the tracks are mired down the mud, we're trying to push something we can't push with a track machine or a wheeled machine, then oil's going to open this relief and just basically bypass the motor. The pump's still pumping the flow, but it's going pump, relief, and back. And of course, this relief is only going to protect our high pressure forward. We're probably going to want to add a cross port relief for reverse as well. So they're telling us here next to go reverse and Again, we've got system pressure high here, but this relief valve can't work bi-directionally. Now we're just going to the spring chamber and helping to lock that shut. So we're going to have to put another relief here, another cross port relief to address high pressure in reverse. So now we've got a forward side relief valve, a reverse side relief valve, and this one again can blow across to the other side of the loop. So that's why we call these cross port reliefs because they don't dump the tank, they dump to the other side of the circuit. So we've got our pressure protection installed. These sometimes are located uh, at the motor. The Sunstrand unit we've looked at in the main shop uh, has these in the hydrostatic drive motor. Much more common on modern hydrostatic systems to have them mounted at the pump. But they can be, theoretically, they can be anywhere in this line as long as we're between the output of the pump and the uh, supply to the motor this relief could work here equally well as here or here where it's installed so anywhere between the pump and the motor uh, work work ports or the pump and the motor port plates is where this relief can go and same for the for the uh, forward side so in the neutral position those reliefs just sit closed and in forward they're generally going to sit close and reverse will sit close until there's 
uh, a load on the system group.